joining today's webinar hosted by FOLU titled No More Waste Time, Wasting Food and Time, National Strategies to Tackle Food Loss and Waste. My name is Katie McCoshin and I'm the Policy and International Engagement Manager for FOLU. Today we're going to dive into the topic of national strategies to tackle food loss and waste. Uh, we see this as one of the critical solutions to the world food loss and waste challenge. Whilst there are many global commitments and milestones to reduce food loss and waste, focusing on national action will really help drive substantial and long-term reductions. And I hope that today we're going to learn from different country experiences and have an open and friendly conversation on these challenges and how we can accelerate implementation together. So to kick us off, it's my pleasure to hand over to FODU's Executive Director uh, and my boss, Morgan de Gillespie, for her opening remarks. Morgan. <laughs> Thank you, Katie, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I am fresh back from New York from Climate Week, and I'm thrilled and excited, uh, thrilled and excited to kick off the session today on such a critical topic of food loss and food waste. It has not been at the forefront of people's thoughts and minds, I feel, for the last couple of years. Um, but we really hope that by raising awareness and driving more action on the ground, we can elevate food loss and food waste to one of the premier solutions to one of the world's greatest challenges, climate change. And why is that? Well, food waste is one of the most clear representations of inefficiencies in our food and land use system. You don't need me to tell you, but we know that a third of all food produced by weight is lost or wa wasted, and that's between farm and fork. Now, when you convert that into calories, this equates to 24% of the world's food supply. So 24% of the calories that we're producing are wasted. Now that is problematic enough, but it's made worse when you realize that more than 700 million still facing hunger today and 3.1 billion people can't afford a healthy diet. Now, if it's not enough, the impact on people, what about the impact on planet? Food loss and food waste accounts for between 8 to 10 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions every year, and it costs the world more than one trillion dollars. So why is this the case? Why can't we change it? Now, interestingly, on the topic of food loss and food waste, we have two things that many other challenges in our space don't have. We already have a political mandate and we already have technological solutions to solve this problem. Now, in terms of the political mandate, first and foremost, we have the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal of 12.3. This goal 12.3 recognizes the need to have per capita global food waste at both the retail and consumer level and to reduce food losses along production and supply chains, including post-harvest losses by 2030. Now, if an SDG specific to this wasn't enough, this has been backed up by two further political mandates. In Africa, we have the Mobolo Declaration, which happened in 2014, so almost a decade ago, where we had African nations committing to have food loss and food waste, so that same language, but they were going to do it by 2025, five years earlier than SDG 12.3 called for. In addition to that, we've seen some movement just this year in the European Union, which has had a platform on food loss and food waste, but this year they have announced for the first time proposals for legally binding targets. And again, this is set both at consumption and production levels, which are being discussed and iterated right now within the EU. Now, if this is successful, and we heard from the European Commission last week at a food loss and food waste event hosted by Champions 12.3 in New York, it is likely that this is going to go through. This could provide a template for further national and regional action. Now, in addition to that SDG 12.3, which is sort of the guiding light here, we do also have the Paris Agreement, right? We need to make sure that we can hold the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. And as I mentioned at the front of this conversation, Food loss and food waste contributes up to 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. So we have this mandate on which to focus our efforts. 
So the political mandate is there. We have it with the SDGs. We have it with the Paris Agreement. We have regional supporting political mandates. What about the technological solutions? Now, here, we actually have a number of solutions that have been locally developed, tested, and are ready to be implemented and scaled. These include things such as optimizing delivery, trade, and transport routes. We can create greater civil society and consumer education campaigns. We can take more regulatory actions, such as improving liability um, for the risk that food bank donors take. And we can take really pragmatic private sector actions, such as streamlining date labeling and product discounting processes in the retail and the service industries. Now, I hope that we'll hear more about some of these great solutions in today's webinar. Now, what are some other things that we as FOLU believe are absolutely necessary to move the needle on targeting and reducing food loss and food waste? One thing that we'd like to call for is that national plans are needed, and they're needed to coordinate action across the value chain on food waste and food waste reduction. What we know is that it differs, right, in terms of commodities, where it occurs in the supply chain, and that looks different in different countries, and even sometimes by different regions. And again, we have panelists from different geographic regions today to talk about that. However, even with this, only a handful of nations have established strategies to reduce food loss and waste. And those include the United Kingdom, where I'm based, the Netherlands, and also Ethiopia, where we have a FOLU platform and Sophia on the panel today. Now, each country needs to create a tailored plan to address this locally. They need to measure and assess the sources of food loss and food waste. They need to explore policy levers, such as waste laws or taxes, setting up national campaigns. They need to establish national strategies on food loss and food waste. These are the guiding frameworks that different government departments and institutions can use so that this becomes a strategic priority for them. And these national strategies can help to align public policies, private sector actions, farmer practices, consumer behavior towards this overarching shared goal, which is important to ensure we deliver on time. Now, FOLU is also a partner with Champions 12.3. They've been one of the biggest advocates of the target, measure, act approach. And we want to amplify the calls for this approach at national level. So ensuring that a country sets out a food loss and food waste reduction target, that they measure to identify hot spots, and that they take action to reduce those hot spots. Right? So what do we need? We need to measure and assess sources of food loss and food waste. We need to explore policy levers. We need to establish national strategies that integrate that target measure act approach. And finally, we want to make sure that food loss and food waste is integrated into countries' nationally determined contributions or NDCs, right? That's the link back to the Paris Agreement that will enable a globally cohesive approach. Now, just one last piece on these NDCs, and then I'll hand back over to the panel. FOLU did an analysis of 24 country NDCs, which covered 80% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And do you know how many of those 24 reflected a commitment to tackle food loss and food waste? I'll give you a second. We had 24. How many do you think included food loss and food waste? Only four. Now, this is a huge opportunity for countries to elevate the strategic importance of tackling food loss and food waste by integrating them into their NDCs. The next time to do that will be by COP30 for the, uh, 2025. And we know that the UAE this year, the COP presidency this year, is calling on countries already to integrate food system into their NDCs and to make those updates. So we can do this. For food loss and food waste, meaningful efforts are there. We have the political mandate. We have the technological solutions. We have the policy frameworks in place. 
And at Folu, we're really looking forward to learning more about how different governments, how different private sector actors, how different public sector actors can take this approach and scale up action now between the end of the decade. So with that message of hope, I hope, I'll hand back to you, Katie, and over to this fantastic panel. Thanks so much, Morgan. I think the message of hope really sang through there. I think food loss and waste is quite uniquely placed in the sense that it has a political will. We kind of know what the solutions are and the role of national strategies is really in bringing all those different um, elements together. So thanks for joining us for the start. I know you might have to drop soon, but it was great to kick off. Thanks. It's my pleasure to introduce our three panellists today. We've got Agnes Malapu, who's the Game Country Director in Indonesia. We have Sophia Ahmed, who's our FOLU Ethiopia Country Director, and Mulvareed Borgazade, who's Senior Policy Researcher at the SDSN Network. So today our panel is split into several parts. First, we're going to think about what are national plans? How do we create them? We've heard they're important, but how do we actually do that? The second point, we're going to move on to having a bit of an open discussion about the challenges and opportunities. And then we're going to move to an audience Q&A. So if you do have any questions at all, please do put them in the chat throughout this webinar. So um, Agnes, I'm going to come to you first to hear more about how GAIN has been approaching this topic of national food loss and waste roadmaps in Indonesia. Thank you, Katie. Yes. That's, um, yeah, I think uh, all now people have paid attention on this um, more and more. I think uh, pay attention on the fit, food loss and waste. And for gain uh, ourselves, so we started uh, working uh, more like a, like a tangible uh, in this area in back in 2000, uh, 2017. So we had uh, that time a project uh, called uh, iPlan or uh, Indonesia Post Harvest Loss uh, Alliance for uh, Nutrition. And um, the, the objective of the project is to improve the domestic supply of nutritious and safe food by reducing post harvest losses of fresh fish. Why we start this project? Um, because when in 2017, um, Indonesia uh, was ranked second in the world in uh, food loss and waste. And uh, annual loss of approximately 13 million tons, uh, that's equating to 300 kgs per person. And uh, that food loss is comprising of 30% of all fisheries products or around 3.8 to 5 million tons per year. As uh, you know, Indonesia is um, archipelago um, countries, uh, we have a lot of uh, fish productions, and but in this, uh, the other side, we have this uh, very um, high of the food loss uh, in the um, fish supply chain as well. Um, meanwhile, Indonesia still have faced huge problem on the mal malnutrition. So in 2017, uh, out, one out uh, of three children under five is stunting and almost 50% of the pregnant woman is anemia. And uh, the fishery products uh, loss actually can be potentially supply uh, protein to these uh, millions of children and also the pregnant woman. So to achieve our objective, we um, conduct uh, two main activities uh, starting in 2018. The first one will be establishing this uh, post harvest alliance for Indonesia nutrition, uh, or we call it uh, GP2GI in Indonesia. We approach potential members. Uh, we also encourage collaborations, and um, we finally formalize this alliance as a, an independent institution. Uh, the the good things of this alliance because it's a uh, uh, up to now has uh, more than 600 members. Uh, this uh, gave the small scale fishermen and sellers uh, collective visibility and voice to have more weight in the discussions with the government and regulators. Uh, we also helped uh, the SME um, access the retail markets by providing technical advice and facilitating them to uh, qualify for the government license and procurement and matching them with the distributors and also the retail uh, companies. Uh, the second activities uh, we was we was uh, conducted this uh, business innovation challenge that's to identify the local innovations. 
uh, the first challenge was on innovations in cold chain technology and the second one on fish based food products. Uh, we provide eight weeks of training and mentoring for the innovators, uh, such as uh, market validation research, uh, licensing and permit and provided seed and funding. Uh, we received more than 500 um, innovative proposal at the time and uh, finalist, uh, finalist products are now also available in the market. <clears throat> so here uh, maybe I can also give you some of the result of the project. So through these uh, two um, activities, we have added a new opportunities for business development uh, on their productivity and also income. Because at the end of the project, uh, over 20,000 cold chain technology products have been sold and used, and the savings of up to a thousand US dollar per fisherman per year uh, in ice or cooling cost. Uh, this is also contributed to reducing energy use in materials. It reduced uh, freezer use by up to 15 hours uh, per day and reduced the plastic bag uh, use also up to 70 bags per day uh, per fisherman. So the project has created also local entrepreneurship and allowed adapt adoption of uh, the new technology. So more than uh, 200 Alliance members have applied this uh, improved post-harvest loss technology and practices to their business. And nearly 400 micro entrepreneurs and SMEs are supported in the fish supply chain sector uh, through business to business and business to government uh, schemes. Also, uh, through new government marketing platform uh, that launched in August 2020, the BIC fin uh, finalists and other innovators have been invited to sell their innovations uh, in this uh, platform. And um, through the National Alliance uh, that I have uh, mentioned in the beginning, we were also able to foster the MOU between the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Marine Affairs uh, and Fisheries. This to reduce the malnutrition to increase the fish consumption. So, uh, fi yeah, my finally uh, word about this project that so through this business innovation challenge, we have identified and promoted crops that uh, were not currently traded, uh, which uh, means opening up also the local economic opportunities and sources of livelihood. And the project has improved a culture of sharing knowledge among the key stakeholders and brought um, positive outcomes on sustainable development and improved the quality of life of local communities as well. So that is about the project um, that we've done and starting uh, work on this uh, area on food loss and waste. And currently we have uh, supported the national of the, the Ministry of the National Development Planning and preparing the, the national roadmap for the food loss and waste uh, to meet the SDGs and um, up to 2045, where uh, the target is to reduce the about 75% of the food loss and waste uh, in country. And uh, I can share because this is still initial stage, uh, but um, I think the commitment of the government is uh, really positive. And then I think this is a uh, very important because kind of this initiative uh, really need a leadership. And as I'm thinking, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, this is, should be uh, the, the local leaderships uh, where gained uh, positioning is more on the supporting and facilitating them and to enable them to, you know, um, conduct uh, in their capacity uh, to achieve uh, what uh, Indonesia uh, aimed to achieve in 2045 on food loss and waste. I think that's all from my uh, side first and I give back to Katie. Thank you. Thanks so much, Agnes. And I think it's it's really interesting that 
what needs to be done um, in different communities, whether you're um, civil society, whether you work in business to get to that MOU buy-in from government and actually coalition building um, is a critical point of that so that producers and SMEs can have their voice heard as well in order to inform effective policies. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Sophia to talk a little bit about how foley has been approaching this um, in Ethiopia as well. Sophia. Uh, thank you, Katie. Uh, for us, uh, Food and Land Use Coalition in Ethiopia, uh, back in, 20, in, in 2020, we have produced our Action Agenda report, which enumerates uh, uh, changes that needed to happen in Ethiopia uh, in terms of um, you know, uh, the way we produce food and uh, the way uh, we manage our land. Um, in those uh, Action Agenda report, we came up with... Uh, uh, food rust and the waste came up as one critical transitions um, in Ethiopia. And um, we start to work in, in that critical transition. And uh, it's one of the key promising entry points that can uh, you know, help us to win uh, uh, multiple uh, targets, uh, as Morgan mentioned, both national and international. And uh, you know um, other commitments at regional, at African Union level as well. Um, we Ethiopia is committed to Paris Agreement, SDGs, Malibu Declaration, nutrition, um, land, and many other biodiversity targets. All which uh, this is um, 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 uh, reducing our food loss and waste is one of uh, uh, a critical um, uh, contribution that can uh, provide us to 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 achieve those all targets. Um, with that, uh, um, if we look at the uh, um, food security, the, the post-harvest loss uh, um, situations in Ethiopia, which is, you can even think of that is one of the low hanging fruit that we need to uh, address. Um, uh, if you look at the implication of that, uh, we are losing around uh, 23 um, you know um, uh, million uh, uh, we are losing a crop value that can feed like 23 million uh, people per year um, the paradox is we are also having the same uh, amount of people food insecure every year which is increasing every single day we are this year alone we have like around 22 million over 22 million people are food insecure in Ethiopia so we need we don't need even to produce more if we want to close that in food security gap. So uh, apart from this global commitment, uh, even the problem that we are facing every single day, we can be managed by you know uh, managing our uh, post harvest losses. Uh, if we this is from from food security angle, if we move to um, you know economic value of it, uh, we are losing one point two billion dollar per year, which is almost 10% of our GDP. This is from economic, economic perspective. Um, leave alone the, the environment health uh, perspective, which was, which was not very well calculated yet. So those alls are giving us a provision or a reason that uh, we should be able to work on post-harvest losses management. With that, we started to have this uh, dialogue with the Minister of Agriculture, and then we agreed that we we need to start uh, from uh, from you know measuring and reporting of our our, our uh, where uh, why where and you know how this uh, loss is happening so that the government can take a proper action. All stakeholders uh, will take a proper action to uh, to 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 change the the, the situation. Um, and then we 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 developed. A customized, uh, um, uh, we call it post standard post harvest loss, customized post harvest loss um, uh, measuring and reporting uh, uh, protocol for Ethiopia. And now, at the moment, we are moving to to uh, one of the crops that uh, we to test that in av uh, avocado uh, value crops to serve as an input in designing uh, solutions for developing comprehensive and sustainable avocado uh, sector. This includes um, 
apart from the protocol, it will be increasing awareness raising and knowledge uh, uh, skill development, as well as uh, supporting the Ministry of Agriculture in post-harvest loss uh, messaging in, in, um, in the extension system, uh, how to uh, prevent um, avocado value uh, chain post uh, harvest losses, uh, as well as market linkage and the need for uh, proper uh, resource allocation. Um, that also includes uh, supporting and encouraging uh, private sector who are now engaged in uh, avocado uh, value chains to to take the you know by themselves a post harvest loss uh, uh, management uh, practices, uh, which mostly will have a, an economic reward for them, but at the later stage, those wins that I have talked will be achieved. Uh, for us, this will be, uh, we hope that we'll, this will serve as a springboard um, uh, to provide a framework for the national uh, adoption of uh, the standard approach that we have produced in all value uh, agricultural commodities um, in Ethiopia. Um, I think that is um, one thing that I would like to mention as we go, I will start to talk more on the yeah. others. Thanks so much, Sophia. Um, and it's really interesting to hear a different approach to kind of uh, national strategies and, and planning uh, through the kind of the data and the measure and the monitoring um, approach as well. So now we're going to go to Mulvereed. And Mulvereed, I know you've worked uh, more globally across different geographies, and it'd be really interesting to kind of hear the different approaches that you've seen um, to national food loss and waste plans. Thank you, Katie. Uh... I think you will recognize many of the things I will say for now. Uh, I would be probably in two parts, uh, how po have public policies approach food loss and waste and what I think is needed. Perhaps some of the things I need, I think are needed would be uh, in the conversation we have afterwards. Uh, so how have um, policies approached food loss and waste? Uh, they've come to food loss and waste prevention and reduction generally associated with broader public approach to food systems with a variety of objectives, including improving food security, ensuring food safety, uh, safeguarding farms and rural livelihoods, preventing municipal waste generation, and more recently, uh, transforming food systems uh, from a circular economy angle, and it entails valorizing organic waste, reducing the environmental footprints of the system, and uh, improving the allocation of finite natural resources. So which instruments are in use? You heard some of them. Uh, some uh, countries have national strategies. They Most of them have international commitments. And more frequently, uh, they implement a variety of ad hoc instruments. Uh, these can take different forms, they, from the very common education and information campaigns, regulations on waste disposal, segregated waste collection and pricing is less frequent. Uh, some have value chain measures, some have mandatory reporting. Sometimes the two are connected. Food waste disposal is generally managed by municipalities. This is why also you heard from other speakers addressing the issue, uh, bringing together at the table different levels of government, bringing at the table academia and research and the private sector and civil society organization. Everyone is involved. Everyone must be involved when we develop a strategy. Um, Initially, I think in, in history, uh, it's not ancient history, it's recent history, the uh, food loss and waste had been approached from uh, by regulations and because of the conditions on land use. And the range from the voluntary segregated collection of organic waste, sometimes specifically food, to pay as you throw and more rarely the exclusion of foods from the waste collection streams of industry and um, generally processing or retail. Uh, while segregated food collection offers opportunities to initiate uh, a valorizing industry, 
the activity is not profitable. And this is what we have observed. Public intervention is often in place to, either to support the supply of the feedstock or the setting up of the industrial facilities. Mandatory measures that apply to industries are frequently associated with reporting, and that's where the notion of measurement is uh, enters the scene. And when it applies, mandatory food waste reporting is com commonly limited to specific sectors or above certain thresholds. Uh, supply chain measures that uh, aim to improve market time transparency, balance asymmetries, and relieve unnecessary constraints can co-benefit food loss and waste reduction. So these have to be borne in mind when we address, uh, develop measures for the food systems and its transformation. Uh, changes in date marking were mentioned, and they aim to improve consumer guidance and avoid misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. Education and information transfer uh, campaigns are more widespread, and they may be global, uh, as the, the, the event we're uh, supporting with our webinar today, which is the uh, uh, International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste, or uh, also mentioned today, the Champions 12.3, and they aim to raise awareness and create momentum for reduction. Uh, while national campaigns can target specific groups, my observation is that they generally address consumers, uh, some even making the economic case for household food waste reduction. I will be very brief on what I think is needed. I think what we need now is to move from declarations and strategies and operationalize what we know. Uh, piecemeal approaches tend to shift food loss and waste from one segment to another in the value chain. We have to consider the entire value chain and involve the whole of government and all the stakeholders mentioned before. And beyond encouraging individual behavior change, policies are needed to address the structural drivers of food loss of waste. While noting that the absence of reliable metrics, we will be operating in the dark for some time still because it's the initiatives are there. We still have not come up with a universal silver bullet for measurement. The opportunities that exist to pre prevent food from being lost and wasted simultaneously can improve the system's re re resilience and build the, the rural livelihoods. Uh, the food system's approach is needed. The role of dog government can be to facilitate the, the dialogue between all the stakeholders, but more importantly is the role of government is to make sure that all the policies are aligned and target the same objective that you don't con you don't contradict yourself one with one piece of legislation and the other. Apropos, uh, I'm very curious about the French announcement today of their uh, ecological transition. I'm curious whether food systems will be included or whether included or whether they still leave it to the Ministry of Agriculture to deal with that, and if included. What would if they would have something to say about uh, food loss and waste? The Thanks, so much, the... Mulberry. Okay, sorry, there's lots to dive yeah. in there, and I'm sure we'll get into it in the, as we move into our discussion. I'm glad you interrupted me. <laughs> no, thank you. There's there's clearly like such a range of objectives um, and a range of different interventions as well um, that we can address uh, when talking about tackling food loss and waste from a government perspective. So our kind of first question, and I do encourage all the panellists to kind of speak to each other. If you jump in and want to have a question um, about a specific case, then then please do that. But more to pick up on your point of how can we build government consensus um, and bring in the different actors. I actually want to come to Agnes first, because Agnes, you mentioned uh, an MOU with the Ministry of Health, with the Ministry of Development Planning and Maritime as well. And I would love to kind of know what approaches you use specifically or what we can learn about how this can be replicated um, in other contexts. Kind of how did you do that? How did you get the, the different governments on board? 
Yeah, thank you, Katie. So I think our approach is, uh, as usual, we start with our mapping. Uh, when we start the project, we start also mapping the key stakeholders and also their programs, because it's uh, many times we uh, saw that is basically some of the ministry have already, say, uh, you know, some part of the uh, intervention uh, in the under their ministry and the other part of intervention on the other ministry. So. I think uh, with the good mapping of the key stakeholders as well as their programs, we can you know, like navigate which one we can like uh, put together and integrate it. As I mentioned in the beginning by uh, Morgan and also by uh, uh, Morfarit, that um, kind of this uh, you know integration is needed. So this is when we saw that is. These two uh, ministry have uh, the same objective. That is uh, to um, improve the uh, consumption of uh, fees. Uh, in the nutrition side uh, of uh, of the minister of um, uh, minister of health, uh, looking this uh, fees is uh, a very good uh, source of uh, protein. And the other, uh, the minister of fisheries is uh, how to promote this uh, because we uh, Indonesia is uh, really abundant with uh, fish production. So. That's, I think, uh, what uh, the, the lesson learned uh, from our uh, project, that uh, kind of this uh, mapping is very important in the beginning of uh, uh, intervention. Thank you. Thanks so much, Agnes. And Sophia, I know that you must have um, undergone a similar mapping with your kind of measurement and, and monitoring exercises. Do you have any kind of key lessons on how um, to approach setting up a national protocol or if there are any findings you've kind of teased out from the, the work piloting this in the avocado value chains. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Katie. Um, for us, is we were, first we were aiming to have uh, this um, uh, national, uh, you know, standard uh, and protocol to be adopted by the Minister of Agriculture. Um, and we worked uh, very well with the Minister of Agriculture. Uh, they are also the, the host of uh, post-harvest platform in Ethiopia. So maybe it is different from other countries because we have big government. We, we you know, almost um, all um, policy actions uh, is more uh, controlled by the Minister of Agriculture. Uh, they are the mandate uh, institutes. This will be done in collaboration with Ethiopian uh, Statistics Authority. So we started with the Minister of Agriculture. We thought that uh, this is, we, 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 were, we are not going to adopt um, any protocols specifically because we haven't heard a lot of stories or success stories around each protocol developed by international community for 12.3 or WRI1 and others. Uh, so we we came up with customized protocol. So maybe I will be talking later at the challenge section, uh, but uh, for, for the key lessons, uh, we, we developed a protocol and uh, where we, we wanted to test this, you know, the lesson that we took from our intervention was we found out that intervention-based approach is best working uh, for us. So what we did was we moved from protocol to practice. So we, we were pushing a lot in terms of generally adopting the protocol for all crops in the uh, basically for all cross because Ethiopia have already produced a post harvest loss management strategy for crops. We did, we we currently are now producing for all uh, value chains like horticulture um, and livestock uh, dairy uh, livestock uh, dairy uh, value chains as well as sort across the integrated ones. So uh, we decided together to move to you know. Uh, work on avocado value chain. So that will be uh, something that, you know, a learning from us that we intervention-based approach is working for us that will help us to, uh, you know, accelerate change in other commodities. That's one thing that uh, we, I would like to highlight in terms of uh, the learning from our intervention over the last uh, couple of minutes. Thanks, Sophia. It's really interesting and because you teed us up so beautifully um, to the next question on kind of challenges, I would love to know a bit more about kind of the key challenges that you faced in supporting those interventions and kind of moving to the to the implementing point. Um, 
challenges. Um, Uh, challenges, um, I don't want to focus more on challenge, but it's change is not happening because uh, to the extent that we want, because there are lots of challenges. We talk a lot uh, in terms of, um, you know, creating understanding, um, you know, having policies and strategies in place, uh, but uh, we are we are not, you know, to, to the extent to the level that we want to make change happen. We keep on talking about the, the importance of uh, post diverse. Yeah. So if talking about the, the challenges, um, I want to, you know, just focus on three challenges. I don't want to, you know, keep on talking challenges. Funding commitment is one of uh, one of the challenge. Uh, the benefit of post harvest loss um, is, as I mentioned earlier, that we can, you know, we can just harvest a lot of benefit by just managing the post harvest loss, but there is no funding commitment that attached to post harvest losses. Uh, there is a political buy-in about the, the, the management of post harvest loss, but there is no budgetary commitment. Policymakers more focused on increasing yield in terms of you know solving for security problems uh, rather than you know um, investing in post harvest loss management this is one thing where, you know it's one of the biggest challenge um, we don't have funds to you know proper funds are not being properly um, addressed to 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 manage post harvest so the other uh, thing is uh, what need to come first is always debatable like for instance we are we are more pushing to uh, measuring and reporting where uh, the loss is happening why it happens and uh, how we can solve that is uh, that is coming from you know at first adopting the protocol and you know doing the analysis and then it will help effective strategy to be in place but as i said most stakeholders including you know the government is more focusing on increasing production and productivity uh, in terms of solving the problem. So there is also more focus on technology rather than in measuring it. It's, it's considered as a burden with less fruit. So we know that it is time consuming. It is um, you know, it takes lots of energy, lots of time, lots of budgets. But it's a place where we start. So, but there is this is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, what need to have come first? Is that measuring? Is that um, you know uh, focusing on uh, uh, production and productivity? Data in knowledge gap is another challenge that needs to be addressed uh, in terms of solid data uh, and capacity in within the government institutions, especially the statistics authority. We need to you know develop that uh, data gathering uh, mechanism in place. Those are the three. Uh, key challenges that need to be addressed very well in order for us to move from A to, you know, B at least. Thanks, Vera, and I hope that we can uh, move on in, in a few minutes to kind of, well, how do we address those challenges? What is Neil needed to scale those? And at Morvridge, you mentioned such a range of interventions. Are there any kind of key challenges? We can stay on the challenges section or we can move on to kind of what you've seen that has been successful um, in addressing some of the challenges Sophia mentioned, whether that's finance, uh, whether that's, you know, how do we navigate uh, trade-offs in, in these discussions, given a food loss and waste can kind of touch on on so many different elements of policy. Perhaps I would um, re re insist that uh, change has a cost, uh, investments have cost, access to finance is key, and support in that area is key. And for those countries who have public support to uh, the sector, they can reorient, repurpose, and perhaps make even conditional. So change, change the drivers and uh, put the emphasis on the, the, the positive aspects of reducing post-harvest loss and reducing farm level loss on reducing uh, sector-wide um, loss and waste. Uh, also to insist on the, 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 the intimidating scale of measurement. Uh, I totally uh, feel for uh, Sophia and uh, Agnes 
uh, when doing it, I mean, you, you just, every time we measure, we realize, oh, we are uncovering some uh, loss or waste we had and uh, accounted. So I think that the focus should be less on the developing this incredible system for measurement that will be harmonized and comparable, except begin small and scale up as we progress. Thanks, Margaret. And, and Agnes, kind of, have you been able to, to use that approach of focusing on the kind of small and scaling up yet? Or has the kind of emphasis just been addressing those initial challenges of, of bringing food loss and waste into the centre of multiple different debates, whether it's nutrition, whether it's um, climate change as well? Kind of what key challenges have been faced uh, in the Indonesia context? Yeah. Thank you, Katya. I think uh, some of are already uh, mentioned by Sophia about the chair, and so of course uh, the funding is to become uh, also an uh, issue. But before that, go to the funding. Uh, itself uh, we still have a challenge here in Indonesia because we don't have uh, the specific regulation on food loss and waste and uh, as I mentioned the regulation is very scattered so there's some piece of what uh, the food waste here but more on the uh, concern on the environment impact rather than really like uh, regulate how we can um, utilize this uh, food waste for example so and that's me cause of uh, the intervention or um, innovations that conducted by some of the organization here very scattered not structured and uh, because they, we don't have uh, regulations yet so I think uh, the, the challenge is uh, now how to really um, bring uh, this agenda uh, as, uh, well, as the uh, priority agenda of the national development planning because uh, we understand that we have to compete with uh, several other agenda by the countries and then how we coordinate this uh, multi-stakeholders so I think that is the most challenging one uh, the coordinations and then how to uh, like uh, get some consensus because uh, even the definition of uh, what is uh, the food waste on the other ministry they have the other def definition uh, under uh, other ministry of uh, food waste uh, also they have a different definition so I think that's uh, we need to consolidate uh, this and get a consensus among its stakeholder and bring it to the you know kind of the um, more specific regulations. We understand also that we have already a lot of regulation in the country, and then whether we have to tie it with or integrate it to the existing one, because there is maybe more effective or uh, efficient rather than develop a new uh, other uh, regulation that is uh, like a compete with other or sometimes not aligned with other uh, regulation. So. I think that is the more challenging one now uh, about this, uh, you know, how to align all these regulations so government can focus and then, yes, and then further how then government can bring more commitments. Uh, in this case, mean a budget commitment to really implement it uh, uh, later at the national uh, regulation and cascade it to the sub-national because I think that is the most important. All the regulation at national needed to be cascaded or translated into the sub-national uh, action plan and regulations. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Agnes. And we're just kind of, everyone's spoken a lot about finance. So I really want to make sure that we can focus a bit on that now as obviously finance is kind of a key lever of scaling. But just to remind everyone that um, in a few minutes, we'll go to the audience questions. So if you do have any, um, then please, please send them our way. So, Sophia, I'm going to come to you first. You kind of mentioned that access to finance um, is key. Is there any particular form of finance that is kind of needed most greatly um, in Ethiopia to kind of shift food loss and waste? And if you kind of had to bump into a key financial actor, um, who would it be and, and what would you ask them for? Um. Post harvest loss, food loss, and waste, it is categorized in the agricultural sector. So access to finance for agriculture is one of the key challenge, I think, in everywhere, um, especially in Africa. If you come to Ethiopia, uh, access to finance for smallholder farmers who was who is in, you know involved in agriculture is you know less than 10%. Even that 10% 
goes to those producers. We, for us, they are not even smallholder farmers who owns less than 1.5 hectare. The majority of our farmers are laser only. So access to finance is completely, um, you know, um, is not something uh, for smallholder farmers is think, uh, thinkable. So where I'm, 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 we, the way we want to go as we go is uh, innovative financing mechanisms that is very well working across um, the globe, especially in, in, in some African countries. We, we want to bring that innovative financing mechanism to solve this kind of problems. But uh, when we talk of access to finance, you know, government should repurpose the already existing um, you know, um, uh, expenditure in agricultural sector because this is the low hanging fruit. Uh, the, in order for me, in order to focus more on production and productivity at its, as it is, but that is needs more effort. But if we spend the already, ex or if we repurpose the already existing agricultural expenditure until we secure innovative financing mechanism, ac you know, access to finance for agriculture. Until that happens, in in the in the in the intermediate time, it is possible to purpose agricultural expenditure towards managing post-harvest loss because that is the low-hanging fruit that can, uh, you know, achieve multiple targets for us. The least is food security, which in our hand we are suffering. So as I said, for Ethiopia, we can you know we can have a, a volume of crops. I'm not talking even the 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 the, the um, fruits and vegetables. Without adding fruits and vegetables, we can have a crop volume of that can feed 23 million people. Why not we repurpose our agriculture? The, you know, we start from incremental change that we move to innovative financing, we move to agriculture far from here. So that is one thing that I want to add. Oh. Thanks, Zafir. Um, and Agnes, you kind of, you touched on the importance of coordination and collaboration what finance or type of finance is is needed to scale um, that up in Indonesia or kind of what finance is needed to support this cascade of, of policies and action nationally to subnationally? I think for the uh, finance or budgets, government already allocate uh, like an annual uh, budget for, for example, agricultures. I think what we need uh, to like um, improve is how to integrate it, this issue already in the planning of the um, uh, agriculture's uh, uh, development in the country, for example. So instead of just focus on the increasing the, the productions, the, but in the strategy, it's already addressed the food uh, post-harvest loss uh, reduction, for example. So not necessary to add uh, additional budget, but how this is uh, more on the action plan is more integrated. So uh, with what resource we have, we can start doing something uh, with our, yeah, uh, revise our uh, our uh, strategy on uh, agriculture, for example, and with my budget that already allocate, maybe we can maximize this and then include already the uh, the reduction of um, post uh, harvest loss. Uh, the the other things I think uh, it's not necessary to to finance. Uh, uh, the first one is of course regulation needed, so the government can allocate budget. So that's why that is very important and crucial. We have to have that first. And the second one, I think uh, the other mechanism is like a, a give um incentive and incentive here uh, can be like uh, the um let's say uh, reduction of tax or something of that for the private sector. So every sector can um, contribute. So not necessarily um, hand it to government to, to, you know, financing everything. But I think the, across the value chains, the private sector is also very crucial. And there is where we have to stimulate uh, through the regulations and then kind of uh, provide a, a facilitating incentive for them to, you know, shifting their, their uh, um, mechanism, productions uh, or uh, kind of that to be more, yeah, um, with the sustainable on the more sustainable way. I think that is um, from my side. Thank you. Thanks, Agnes. And and Mulbridge, you kind of mentioned some of those regulatory mechanisms and, and incentives. Are there any that spring to your mind that have been really successful in, in scaling action on food loss and waste that we might want to, to look at expanding those into different geographies? 
I think it's very uh, cultural in a way. Uh, for example, the pay as you throw is uh, implemented in urban Korea. I'm not sure it would be easily uh, uh, integratable in other places, in other geographies. Uh, the, the, also, the things uh, you were asking for success, I'm going to say uh, this, something that's not exactly a success. For example, in Japan, they, uh, they, the duty of dealing with your waste uh, is with any sector um, uh, actor. So retail, rather than having waiting for the shelf life to, of a product to be over, uh, sends it back to the to the processor. So what that's why when we set up regulations, when we set up laws and rules, we have to have everyone at the table so that they can raise their hand and say, "Oh, but this is not going to work because it's going to push the." push the loss of waste in, to another sector. What I wanted to say is that the role of government, of course, we need finance, that's for sure, but sometimes doing other actions on the supply chain also helps. Uh, the provision of infrastructure, of communication roads, uh, transport, the, max, the existence of markets, the existence of uh, the reliable provision of electricity. Uh, all of these are empowering and enabling the sector to deal with the issues it's facing. Advisory services also are key uh, to uh, scale. So when you, when you have one initiative that works, through advisory services, you can uh, transport it to other farmers, other sectors, uh, other products. So uh, there's the uh, the enablers that are important too. Thanks so much, Maureen. And just in our last few minutes, we had a question, Sophia, um, from the audience, which were they were very keen to know more about the protocol on measurement and monitoring, and if this is adapted from the existing protocol. Uh, oh, it's it's yes, it is. What we did was, you know, we 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 mapped all the protocols developed globally and then uh, we looked at the strengths and the weaknesses of each protocol we considered the local context and then we came up with a standard customized protocol from each uh, from each um, strengths of protocols and then we developed um, you know, standard uh, standard protocol of for green particularly because we at that time when we produce we have green uh, post harvest loss management for Ethiopia, so that is um, um, a combination of all, uh, which uh, is also it, it takes uh, a, a lot of time in terms of you know validating if that's what we are trying to do in avocado chain value chain, but we we are very much open uh, to adopt any protocol because we really want government to start to measure and uh, report they know how where in being happened I mean, in terms of uh, the in, in the value chain so we are not proponent of this customized protocol but the demand is came in and then we we want to you know serve um, um, the system thanks so much fair and thanks everyone i just kind of want to in the last minute um, offer offer a few thoughts on national strategies. It really sounds like they're a very clear way of bringing in collaboration and, and coordination and making sure that food loss and waste is not just tied to different um, national agendas, but also we can make sure that we have the nutrition security element. We can make sure we talk to energy security, climate change. And I think that is one of the real strengths of having these national strategies is to kind of bring all the actors together, bring the issues together, um, and also make sure that finance is brought in with that. And repurposing existing finance is a way to amplify and scale up action. And so is implementation. So going straight to, to piloting and doing the action as a way to kind of then feed upwards um, to make sure that there can be a coherent and collective voice. And Morvid, I think you said it very well when you said have everyone at the table um, and I think that's what's very important to everyone so I want to thank Agnes, Sophia, Morfred and uh, Morgan for joining us today and also our Foley colleagues Clara, Sophie and Hannah and Jake for making this happen so thanks everyone and have a good day. Thank you Katie. Yes. For thank you. Okay.
Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.